the name you're using is a uh, Jekyll. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's uh, Jekyll. Where would this name come from? Well, the actual name um, it's pretty much a compilation of my first and middle name, uh, Jesse Michael. Um, more or less, it's it's not very death metal related per se, but uh, one of the main reasons I kind of started going by that is because half of the people I know call me Jesse, half the people I know call me Michael. At any rate, so I just decided to blend the two and kind of throw it in there as more like a, just kind of like a persona in a sense. And you're the new vocalist and bassist for Amon. Yes, sir. And man, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm stoked to have the position. Uh, you know, walking into that, obviously being a huge DSI fan, you know, growing up, um, you know, and then getting that opportunity to work that closely with Eric and Brian has, has been nothing short of awesome for me. Um, not only has it been fulfilling on a spiritual level, it's just, you know, working that closely with Eric. You know, he's such a phenomenal, you know, guitar player, uh, and he's really helped me to step up my game, you know, especially since, uh, you know, on, on the on the whole record, you know, I'm using a, a custom-built, seven string bass from Conklin and I tune it pretty much just like a seven string guitar only it's down a whole step and so working with Eric he's like yeah you know you're doing these sweeps right and I'm like oh okay great <laughs> you know I'm think I'm thinking I'm going to be a bass player you know kind of focus more so on the vocal part of it and he's like no what you're going to have to do is basically uh you know do all these killer sweeps and runs and do the vocals and so you know it's been a, it's been a challenge but man it's, it's been rewarding at the same time you know so not staying to the traditional four string like Len Benton did in DSI. Uh, no, I mean today, I mean four strings are, uh, you know, I don't want to really say irrelevant because they're not. You know, there's always a place, and you know, you don't need a, a multitude of strings to be a good bass player. But for what, uh, for what the new Amon is doing and the, the direction we're going, you know, anything less than a six string would have been irrelevant. Because like I said, I mean a lot of these uh, sweeps and runs, I mean it's almost identical to what the guitars are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just I have that advantage of having that low A as my deepest string. And so when that comes into play, it's just, just earth shattering, you know, it's just a, just a great sort of, a you know, sort of a vibe. And so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I didn't see any reason to, to not use the seven, you know, the seven string on this. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 like I said, it's been a challenge, but very rewarding. <laughs> What's your background in, in music? Where do you come from to join Amon, let's say? Sure. Well, um, you know, I was pretty much born and raised in Northeast Tennessee. Um, you know, I had done a sort of uh, a heavy metal, sort of a heavy metal, almost death metal type thing up there called uh, Eviction. And so that, you know, lasted for about seven years. And then I moved to Tampa when I was probably around, um, say, 22 to 23 years old. I'm 29 now, but, you know, so I moved here probably, you know, seven, eight years ago. And then I started getting into just the local scene. I ended up, uh, the first death metal musician I really met, you know, after I moved here was Antar of Diabolic, mm -hmm. um, you know, the drummer for Diabolic. And then at that time he had started on Holy Ghost. And so I came in at that point and it wasn't maybe about a month after I met him that he said, hey, you know, I'm kind of, I'm leaving on Holy Ghost, you know, for, for whatever altercations. And he said more or less, hey, you know, let's start up a band. Um, you know, and then we started up, uh, you know, a group together. It was just called, it was called Blast Masters. Um, you know, sort of a cheesy name, but hey, you know, the music was killer. We put out an album called Twisted Metal, um, you know, and it got pretty good reviews, you know, and um, aside from that, you know, I moved and kind of just did a couple of one-off things. Like, you know, I joined uh, a band called After Death, which, you know, was fronted by Mike Browning, which is pretty pretty famous for his uh, for his stint with Nocturnus and, you know, him being the original drummer and vocalist for Morbid Angel, you know, it was kind of a mm -hmm. kind of a fun little thing we did there for a while. Um, I broke away from that because I wasn't really feeling kind of the direction it was going. There was more or less kind of a generation gap between what he wanted and his vision of, uh, you know, compared to what I wanted, you know, because I'm more into, you know, just the traditional death metal, you know, with extreme aggressive vocals and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, all those guys are great. You know, I've, I've definitely met some great musicians. But what really led into me joining Amon was um, I had uh, auditioned and I had taken up uh, the bass position for a band, a local grindcore band that more or less, I mean, none of the members were from Tampa, but it's, you know, it got its start in Tampa. It was called SWATS or Successful Right Apocalypse Across the Sky. Um, and then maybe 
nine months, maybe even more than a year. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to not be so much into the grind core, but it, at any rate, at that point, you know, the drummer for Ramon right now, Mikey, he was already, you know, in Avon at the time. And then he was, you know, kind of proactive and saying, Hey, you know, if we need a bass player and a singer, you know, let's check this guy out. And so pretty much what happened is I went over there, brought my gear over to Eric's, over to Eric's, uh, rehearsal spot, you know, plugged in, started doing, you know, some of the stuff I've, I was already kind of versed in, you know, just some of the, the speed runs, you know, the speed picking, mm -hmm. the, um, some of the sweeps that I was doing, you know, uh, and he said, Hey, you're hired. And I was like, wow, really? <laughs> just like that. I mean, not to mention we hit it off real well on a personality level, because as soon as he learned that, uh, you know, I was, I'm really into, I don't want to say it's conspiracy theory, because in my opinion, they're not at all theories. It's more or less a conspiracy reality. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as we started just firing off, you know, ideas and some of the research we had done, um, you know, it was just almost an instant connection. And the same with Brian, you know, I mean, me and Brian just, you know, we hit it off so quickly. It was just almost like it was just meant to be, you know, there's never really been any sort of you know, altercations or negativity surrounding the group ever since, you know, we've probably been, uh, probably been together as a group now for going on a couple of years, maybe a little bit more. Um, and so that's more or less how I kind of got into it. And so was I surprised when I got it? I was like, yeah, because, you know, like I said, I'm from Tennessee. I'm just, you know, <laughs> I just came here hoping to get into something and, you know, to end up jamming with Eric Hoffman and Brian Hoffman to me, it was just nothing short of like, wow, you know, now, let's say when you were younger, you must have, you know, bought the DSI albums, you know, cassettes or CDs. Absolutely, absolutely, and, you know, and I have every single DSI record up until, um, you know, after Scars of the Crucifix, because, you know, I mean, I had, you know, briefly spoken with a couple of members of DSI right after Scars of the Crucifix came out, you know, it was, um, you know, they did, I think, the Sun and Steel Fest back in the early 2000s. Um, you know, here in kind of Pinellas in the Tampa area. So I had, you know, seen Eric walking across the crowd, but at the time, you know, I just never had, I didn't, you know, have the guts to really say anything to him because, you know, he's Eric Hoffman and I was right. just kind of there at the show as a fan. You know, I didn't want to swamp him, you know, with like, oh God, I've been a fan of yours since I was, you know, 14 or what have you. But, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's pretty much, you know, along those lines with that. So what would be your favorite, you know, DSI classic? album that's uh i would say that's a, a tough one but it really isn't you know i mean a lot of people are going to be bigger fans of the older stuff um but for me i mean it would have you know had to have been a, a you know a serpent of the light only because it was just such a, a polished album you know everything was just really straightforward and interpretable you know you could just hear every single note that was happening and Honestly, I mean, I love that record because my favorite song, Idea Side, is The Truth Above. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily because of just the lyrical content. It's just, you know, I mean, from what I understand, I think Brian, you know, actually wrote that song. And it just has such a catchy little melody to it. Not to mention it's about aliens. So <laughs> naturally, I'm like, all right, cool. This is my song, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I, you know, after Scars of the Crucifix, when Eric and Brian left, I just, to me, you know, it's just, to me, that was kind of the end, and I just wasn't really concerned with where the aside was going to go after that, just because, you know, as, as normally is the case, when the heart of the band leaves, or when, you know, when there's that initial splitting or parting of the minds, you know, some, a lot of bands just seem to lose their charisma, mm -hmm. um, and so I just wasn't really concerned with what they were going to do next, and frankly, what I have heard then do you know obviously you'll hear this time and time again that you know some of the music is 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 really great uh but it's still just it doesn't seem to me like it's the same band you know i'm sure a lot of people feel that way too amon uh, is great to see you know it's uh, alive and well now um have you guys ever played a gig in these two years because i have not seen uh, nothing we actually have not played any gigs um you know this this whole thing i mean it's just been very methodical and very strategic the way that uh, the way that these guys wanted to roll it out um you know we spent quite a bit of time rehearsing uh we spent you know a lot of time just kind of putting the album together we wanted to make sure that it was something that was worth waiting for you know i mean it would have been real simple just to throw something out there and say hey the hoffman brothers have returned you know but by the time i had joined the band they had been um, sort of on a hiatus for 
you know, several years, I, I believe. You know, it just wasn't it wasn't something that they just wanted to kind of say, hey, welcome to the band. We're getting ready to put out an album. You know, they wanted to to make sure that everyone was on point. Um, like I said, I mean, when I joined the band, I was anticipating simply being, you know, kind of a just a, a bass player and a vocalist, you know. But when, you know, it started unraveling, Eric, as I mentioned earlier, Eric saying, hey, you know, learn this sweep. And I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm watching him playing it, thinking, yeah, it looks a lot easier when you do it because the neck of my bass is like over twice as thick as, <laughs> you know, and twice yeah. as wide. I mean, the fretboard is just so huge. And so what it, what it has to boil down to is I'm covering more than twice as much area in the same amount of time. And so it took me, you know, months and months and months really to, tar- to start to hammer down on these, on these sweeps and some of these runs, you know, because basically... You know, there, there's nothing that's really basic about the music. There's some parts in it that are, you know, groove oriented, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's 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 unlike anything that anyone's ever heard them do. You know, and it's um, and I'm telling you that on the from the respect of the fact that I, you know, I'm still a fan of what Eric and Brian, and Brian did, and so from a DSI fan perspective, I'm saying yes, this is some pretty out of this world stuff, you know, coming from them. I think that um, you kind of got an idea of where they were going on mm-hmm. Scars of the Crucifix, you know, because, I mean, a lot of the, the solos and things that were starting to come out right. were a lot more, um, I want to say virtuoso-esque, <laughs> for lack of a better word, but, you know, it's a lot more just, um, you know, polished, and, you know, I, you know what I'm saying. Eric Hoffman uh, the other day told me that you're like a, a young Glenn Benton voice. Well, <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I mean, uh, I never really met Glenn per se, but there's two people um, that pretty much single-handedly taught me how to do death metal vocals, whether or not they they realize it. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really good friends with one of them. You know, the other one is Glenn Benton, but, you know, one of the, the vocalists that I took most of my, um, I don't know, I, t- I took a lot of my input from him, you know, just how I wanted to learn was George from, from Cannibal Corpse, mm-hmm. you know, Corpse Grinder. I mean, that guy. You know, when I started getting into death metal, you know, Cannibal Corpse was obviously one of the first bands I got into. And when I got into Cannibal, you know, Chris Barnes had already been out of the picture for a couple of years. And so the first record I got was Gallery of Suicide. And, you know, just hearing him, you know, do that, how authentic and how brutal and gory he sounded, you know, it literally sounded like he was grinding corpses, you know, through his vocal cords. And so I took a, took a lot of uh, notes and a lot of pointers. I started out kind of, you know, as a, as a teenager, started out kind of whispering along, and as soon as I figured out that I had gotten that actual tone for simply whispering, all I did at that point was just simply try to apply volume to the actual, um, to the actual thing itself. You know, because it's it's about contorting your throat in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And believe me, I mean, I, I do feel that there are better ways to accomplish a good solid growl than than others. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But everyone out there can tell a difference between how Chris Barnes does his growls versus how George does his growls, or how you know Glenn Bitten used to do his growls and how he does them now. You know, there's like so there's so many different um, you know elements to it. Uh, you know, a lot of people do seem to believe you know that that the way Glenn sounded back in the day was a lot better. Um, I'm kind of am, am a fan of what he was doing, sort of in the mid stretch of, mm-hmm. of the aside. You know, being a, a more contemporary death metal fan. You know, I mean I. I'm more of a fan of the stuff that came out in the 90s. Like, I mean, from 95 to, uh, like, 99, 2000, I mean, to me, like, some of the best death metal records came out at that point in time. And so, you know, I just took a lot from those, you know, but I wasn't a huge, huge fan of what Glenn's vocals sounded like, you know, on, uh, you know, on Legion, or even on, like, maybe the first Amon, you know, Feasting the Beast. I mean, it wasn't something that I wanted to emulate, but, you know, I just kind of came to the table bringing you know what i've always done uh and so if people interpret that as being hey you, you know you kind of sound like a young glenn then cool i mean i, I can't say that that's a bad thing because they're obviously you know trying to compliment me on it but uh yeah i mean so that's pretty much that you know i, I think it's a great compliment you know because of, of the power he used you know in the first dsi album legion also you know even once upon the cross it's got a certain deliverance coming out of it you know I, i've not heard your voice yet so i'm sure it's going to deliver sure. Sure, yeah, I mean, that's I can tell you. I mean, we spent a lot of time, um, you know, just making sure that the vocals came out, 
uh, extremely powerful. You know, I mean, there were times when, you know, I was in the studio recording the vocals and I did something and I felt really good about it. But then, you know, Eric would look at me and he'd say, well, let me listen to it again. Then he'd be like, yeah, do it over. And I'd be like, oh, all right. And so at that point, I would lay down the same vocal part, but only I would be slightly pissed off, you know, <laughs> because it's like, okay, now I'm just redoing what I just did. I was okay with it, but, you know, the end result would be that it would just be that much better, you know, because I had that little bit of, oh, all right, you want better? Here you go, you know. And so it kind of came down to that. But, it, you know, it was an extremely uh, tedious process. You know, we we spent time. We wanted to make sure that almost, like, you know, literally every word that came out of my mouth, we wanted to make sure that you could interpret what I was saying which is something that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of lyrics in death metal, death metal has some really great lyrics, despite the fact that, you know, it's about gore or murder or sacrifice or what have you. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's extremely poetic in its own way, mm -hmm. but a lot of the lyrics get lost in translation because, you know, you just can't really, um, you know, understand what a lot of, or what a lot of these guys are saying. But, you know, I, I understand speaking from experience, it is extremely difficult to make, proper enunciation when you're contorting your throat in that way so i'm not trying to, to knock on anyone because it is definitely a difficult task but it's just an aspect of, of this record that we wanted to make sure was almost in i don't want to say impeccable because you know i don't want to set everyone's expectations too high but i will say this um that what we ended up with everyone in the band was completely thrilled with and even the producer mark prater was like wow you know you're really doing some some good stuff here you know i mean i can hear every word you're saying um you know the the the, the meter and the timer and the, the whatever's going on you know within the the rhythms of the vocals is extremely you know he it was to his liking you know and him you know mark prater is not a, a huge huge fan of, of death metal that i know of you know just as a as a fan you know but he you know was there to kind of lend his ear and say i don't know man you know i mean you could maybe do it a little better you know i, I didn't quite get the vowel sound on this one word you know maybe do it again and so it was extremely tedious but it was well worth it and like that we'll have a original product coming out unlike we've never heard absolutely well that's great jackal thank you uh, so much for taking the time to um, do this interview um, hopefully you guys get a lot of success and fame with this uh, rebirth of amon sure absolutely you know and i do want to thank uh, everyone at pure rock radio for having me out um, i will say one last thing though um, if anyone out there is uh, curious as to what the, the lyrical content will be pertaining to, more or less what I can tell you is this, that it is a semi-in-depth review of religious and political oppression with full awareness of extraterrestrial involvement and even, in some cases, manipulation. <laughs> Incredible. So that's more or less my rundown of it. We're going to talk to you again in the future when the album comes out with the review talk. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. I cannot wait. And thank you very much, Jason, for having me on and uh, for letting me be a part of this. And I'll certainly be, uh, you know, available in the future for any, uh, you know, future occurrences. Good, sir.